As we announced on the 20th of July, we have so far confirmed nine cases of COVID-19 among a number of our citizens who were repatriated from India on the 1st of July. All of these cases are border quarantine cases, uh, meaning that they've had zero interaction with the public and each have been uh, securely uh, held securely in uh, military monitored uh, isolation since their diagnosis since the 20th of July and we have not confirmed any new case of the virus. However, unfortunately, a number of these returning Fijians were elderly and had serious underlying medical conditions, factors which both greatly increase the risk of mortality. Our first border quarantine case of COVID-19 was a 66-year-old gentleman who was returning to India, to Fiji from India after receiving surgical treatment in India for long-standing cardiac condition. Sadly, despite the best efforts of our healthcare professionals, this gentleman passed away yesterday in the isolation ward at Lotok Hospital due to complications from COVID-19. The Ministry of Health and Medical Services ex has extended our sincere condolences directly to this gentleman's family, who we have remained in constant contact with since his diagnosis. This is enormous tragedy for them, and I can tell you our staff at the Ministry of Health and Medical Services are devastated by this loss as well. It is important to note that this gentleman contacted the virus while in India, a country which is in the midst of a large-scale outbreak of COVID-19. In many other countries, news of the first death due to the virus has signaled an intensifying of the outbreak. This is not the case for Fiji. Again, the virus is not present in Fijian communities, nor is there any risk of infection among the Fijian public. Fiji is committed to repatriating our citizens from around the world because we have the confidence and the capacity to do so without risk, risking our status as a COVID-contained country. We were well prepared for the risk that our citizens abroad could contract the virus. Because we know how deadly this disease can be, we were also well prepared for the risk of a fatality, and we've handled the situation in line with our infection prevention control protocols to ensure no risk to the public. Owed to our exhaustive preparation and our commitment to repatriate our people wherever possible, we don't have to read a headline in a foreign newspaper about this gentleman passing away while stranded from his family overseas. Instead, we were able to bring him home to Fiji, safely diagnose him and treat the severity of his condition as well as it could be treated. This gentleman's family is now making funeral arrangements to have him buried in, buried in Fiji. And now I speak for all the ministry, particularly for this gentleman's attending physicians, when I say how deeply affected we are all by this loss. And I'd ask the media to please be considerate of the family's privacy during this unimaginably difficult time. And thank you. We'd like to reiterate this is a border quarantine case who was safely was identified early, isolated early. There were uh, irredeemable complications that we could not uh, that could not be reversed that he developed, and therefore it does not represent any manner of lockdown or public uh, it, uh, or any uh, change in the status of our country as we stand. The public remains safe and we continue to be a COVID-contained country. Thank you. We welcome any questions. Minister, uh, can you just outline <coughs> what are some of the funeral protocols that the health ministry might have in place when uh, dealing with a COVID-19 death uh, in terms of procession, funeral procession, uh, those who are attending? Can you just speak on that? As uh, we've highlighted in the statement, um, there are uh, WHO uh, prepared guidelines uh, and these have been uh, things that uh, our experts have been talking with WHO and um, having that guidance. Uh, as you may be aware that we were the 163rd country to have COVID-19 
uh, we've been able to learn from what other countries have had to do with those who have been very sick and also with those who have passed on. And we've made sure that uh, all those guidelines that we have in place, we've been uh, put those strategies in place in all our facilities where we've had COVID-19 patients, uh, making sure that uh, the, our staff understand what needs to be done when patients get sick, but also uh, ultimately what happens when we do face a scenario such as this. So this is in a way not new to us. Also remember that within the Ministry of Health, we have patients that become very unwell, yeah, unwell and are admitted into the intensive care unit from other forms of infections, uh, and they have strict infection control processes in place. And so those guidelines that WHO has, together with the fact that we've, uh, our staff have had a lot of practice dealing with other uh, uh, severe infections, have uh, prepared us to be able to have those protocols in place for this particular gentleman. And their family uh, has been notified as uh, the statement uh, that we prepared today and you know we've been in discussions with the family, they completely understand what needs to be done and uh, you know that process uh, then carries itself through. Minister, apart from the uh, funeral arrangements for uh, those medical officers that came into contact with the disease, uh, what sort of uh, arrangements have you protocols have you uh, will be doing in terms of ensuring their safety for the time? Yeah, so the um, infection control process that are in place, uh, as you know, simple things such as the post, uh, the protective equipment, uh, the personal protective equipment, uh, the quarantine. Uh, for those staff that have been in contact uh, with the patient uh, after this, that does happen. So those processes doesn't change, um, including uh, making sure that um, uh, you know the staff that were involved in in in, in, in making the body uh, prepared and then bringing the, the the person down from the ward. Uh, you know all those have been looked into. And as I said, uh, those things have been prepared well in advance. Uh, and our staff have actually prepared themselves around the guidance that WHO has prepared uh, about you know, COVID-19 and in the event that we are at the place that we are now uh, with our, uh, this patient being a, you know, a, a quarantine border case and passing away. I think I should just add that... Uh, Right from the very outset, even before we had the first case, we had already developed protocols for dealing with severe cases. And uh, I mean, we just, we've known for quite a while that this person was not well. And uh, staff had already activated their clinical protocols for dealing with severe cases for quite a while. And they, uh, we, are, we are very confident that they never deviated from any of it because they kept us uh, abreast of what they were doing all the while until they, until what happened last time. So would you be able to provide the update of the other uh, COVID, uh, border quarantine cases or in isolation, including the son of the deceased? Yeah, so all, all the rest of the patients so far, they are well. Um, and, um, you know, including the son. Uh, as I said, this is a difficult time difficult time for the son, for the family, and also difficult time for us, for our staff uh, that are looking after them. Uh, but again, you know, this is, um, uh, you know, we are asking the media to be mindful of that, uh, that this is also a difficult time for his family, and, you know, to give them, uh, you know, the, the, the necessary space uh, so that they can be able to find closure. Uh, as we are aware, uh, this patient was coming back after having, uh, you know, an, a treatment done uh, in India, uh, just like many others that have gone. From the Ministry of Health, we've had 60 uh, patients that we had supported either fully or partially, and they've all come back, uh, including uh, this gentleman. And uh, as you are aware, uh, whilst in quarantine, tested, found positive, was unwell, taken into the hospital, and just like any other patient, 
had times that was a bit better, times were unwell until he's passing on. Uh, so we have to understand that uh, you know the, the family need to be able to grieve, to be, to be able to find closure, and we have to give them that space. Minister, how many of your current active cases had also received surgery of that serious nature in India? I don't have the number off the top of my head. Maybe there was uh, this, but uh, these five cases out of the uh, ones that were positive that were had uh, significant comorbidities that required some uh, change, uh, some, uh, some treatment in India. Um, I think that's about all that we can actually say, yeah, because. Uh, uh, apart from this gentleman, there are other people. Uh, there are other people who also had significant treatment that I think we need to respect a bit more their privacy also. Yeah. Um, as you did with the first wave of cases, where you told us uh, a little bit about um, how they were being kept and the condition that they were in, could you t tell us a little bit about uh, the condition that your current active cases are in? Are they serious, critical, or are they like your first few cases where they were? Uh, relatively able to walk around, move around, and casual, if I could put it that way. So the rest of the patients are stable. Um, this is the patient, uh, and again, um, the it is a it, you know it became a very dynamic situation within the last uh, 48 hours, uh, I would say. Um, and again, you know, uh, with all respect to the family, we had to make sure uh, that they were involved in uh, what was happening, his treatment in intensive care. And, um, you know, until uh, un the unfortunate uh, circumstances uh, in which has led to his passing on. Uh, but again, as I said, it, 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 it's very dynamic uh, in, in that respects. Uh, one thing that it does show is that uh, the vulnerable, uh, they are at risk with this disease. And it's not different from whether we're in Fiji or whether in other places around the world. And those who have underlying comorbidities, and those that have had a major operation, those that are elderly are vulnerable. The young uh, may get sick, may become unwell, may actually get through this. And this actually brings to the point, if anything, uh, in terms of uh, how we can be able to, uh, you know, m uh, continue to move on, and for us as a Minister of Health, continue to be strong in the in the in the processes that we have in place in protecting this nation, mm -hmm. we completely understand that the best way to protect our our moms and dads and our grandfathers and grandmothers. I have a 98 year old grandmother. Is to make sure that we protect this nation. Is to and is to make sure that we contain it. And, uh, and I think that's, you know, brought it to the fore of how important it is that we need to work hand in hand. But as the Permanent Secretary <coughs> said, and also uh, as I've said in the statement, uh, this is a, you know, border quarantine case. It's a containment. The containment is still in place. But we need to understand that we, in this that we don't have community transmission, then we need to understand that we are indeed in the new normal.